groups of stuff that we've already had, I realized when I was talking with the other group, um, and then we'll do the second half on Thursday. We'll do the second half of these things on Thursday. Um, let me get out of this, close that, and then I can close this, and I can close this, and I can close this. Okay. All right. Now, these are their infamous clicker questions. Where's the thing? Here it is. All right. So, go ahead and yeah, get out a sheet of paper. And then this way, we can, I can probably remember to collect the quiz right before you all, um, way before you all leave, like right when we get done. It's not really a quiz. It's just kind of a attendance thing, really, more, I, more or less. I don't I don't even know. Well, and it's also to help people's grades, too. So that if the test in that grade, you can come storming back with good quiz grades. Ah, here comes James. There he goes. He's made it. For everyone out in TV land, that was James. All right. Anybody else out here? Nope, nobody else. All right. Okay, and um, I won't be in the office. I'll, I'll be in the office a little bit tomorrow, um, at least until from like 10 till 2 or so, and then i got to teach and then take it off. And then Thursday, I'm just going to be here to teach your class for the most part. My stepdaughter is getting married this weekend, um, so... I am the human Prozac for my wife. All right, I got to keep everything, remain calm, things okay. All right, um, and for my stepdaughter when she gets in town from Seattle, because it's it's. I mean, I've in, participated in, in the invasions of other countries, and this is more complicated. So um, anyway, all right, so. That's what we'll be doing. All right, so let's go to the slideshow. And let's just take this from the current slide, this one right here. We don't need their advertising dollars. All right, anyway, so all right, we got Bonnie and Clyde, our two bunnies here. All right, um, <laughs> the authors of this are even older than I am. But anyway, OK, so we got Bonnie and Clyde. The merry-go-round makes one complete revolution every two seconds. Therefore, what's its period, just before we get any further? What's the period of this thing? There we go. Yeah, 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 it's two seconds. All right. I don't want to make it too complicated. What would be the frequency? How many turns does it make per second? One half. Remember, because you take the period and just flip it over, and you get the uh, frequency. So it's a, it does a half a turn per second. Um, okay, now then, let's answer this question. Bonnie sits on the outer rim. Clyde is on the inner rim. Uh, the merry-go-round. Clyde's angular velocity, angular, omega, little omega, is it the same as Bonnie's, twice as Bonnie's, half of Bonnie's, quarter of Bonnie's, four times Bonnie's? Omega, which one is that? We're trying to think of what, what is it same, different? They're opening up the, all right. Remember, omega measures the change in the angle over change in time. Is the angle that they're going through the same? Yes, over the same amount of time. So what does that lead us to? A, there we go. Whew, this could take a minute, but that's all right. We got time. Want to make sure we get it down now. So omega, the omega is going to be the same. Let's see. Yeah, the angular velocity is going to be the same. All right. But now, the tangential velocity, what is that going to be? The tangential, Bonnie sits on the outer rim. Okay, now remember, tangential velocity is equal to r times omega. So if omega is the same for both of them, Both are the same? Who's going to go faster? 
Bonnie. Okay, right. Uh, sometimes don't let your common sense go away from you as you're trying to learn all these formulas and everything. In other words, if if you if you're the outside person and you've got to make the long trip around in the same amount of time as someone going shorter, you've got to really haul. Yes. Uh huh. Right. Oh, really? Oh, okay. And then the inside has to slow down, so that's why it deposits um, the sediment. Oh. Because it loses its, you know, so it can't carry sediment. Oh, okay. It, I, it's kind of nice. Yeah, it's, it's all, yeah, geosciences is really geophysics. It really is. Um, which is, which, where does the water flow faster, at, in the middle of the stream or at the edge? Well, the end or? And just in the, in the straight part. In the middle. In what? Yeah, that depends on so much stuff. <laughs> That's why geoscience is so hard because there's no perfect solution. The Earth, Mother Nature is just kind of messy, all right? But we try and make it as, make her as clean as possible, but she's just kind of messy. All right. Well, our models make her messy, but anyway. Okay. All right, now then. Oh, okay, yeah, so it's looking for, okay, now, okay, here we go. Oh, we're not going to do that one. Da, 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 it's one half. All right, okay, truck smell, all right. Let's see, take your old 1993 sh little Chevy S10 truck, all right, and you put those monster wheels on it. You're driving down the road now with this big monster truck. Is your speedometer, if your speedometer is based on, and it is for the most part, uh, most people's speedometers are based on the size of the tires that they have. So it's based on the angular, it's based on R, a fixed R times omega. So as it's going around, it's, it's thinking, oh, it's got this little R. Now you put these big humongous tires on it, now R is huge. And you're going to have the same omega. So what's going to happen? And your speedometer um, is telling you your axial uh, velocity, which is the same thing as V equals R omega, as your tangential velocity. The speed of the axle is the same as the tangential speed, OK, going around the tire. So what's this going to do? If you're driving down the road, and your speedometer says 65, and the speed limit is 70, are you going to get pulled over? Especially if you're in Pleasant Valley, where three miles over is a capital offense. <laughs> All right? And that's out there in TV land, too. So, Pleasant Valley Police. YSY 250, my, white Mazda 6, in case you're looking for it. Anyway, all right, so uh, they know it by heart. All right, so you got to speed up. So, what's it going to be? Speedometer reads the lower speed in the then the true linear speed, is that the answer? Because we've got a bigger R, same omega. So V is going to be much faster. The actual speed is going to be much faster, but your speedometer is going, oh, I'm still on the little r. So it's going, so it's saying, oh, you're, you're fine at 65, but actually you're, you're zipping right along at over 70. I hope B is the answer. Yes, sometimes I oversell it and get it wrong, and that's a bad thing. All right. So that's not bad. OK. Angular displacement. Now, this is where we're talking about uh, theta displacement type stuff. OK, an object at rest. Now, remember, this is just like normal displacement OK, uh, in x, except that now we're going around in a circle. So if we've got, here's the main question. If we've got an acceleration, and we're talking about the displacing of the angle. Is that a simple linear relationship or is that a quadratic relationship? Meaning, is it a squared thing? Or is it just a straight t thing? Do you remember what your equations look like for theta, for just the, for x? Remember, we said, oh, x equals, ooh, that's a nice, all right. X equals uh, V naught T plus one half A T squared. And if that's zero, we're going to say that. So that is, is that a linear equation or a quadratic equation? That's a quadratic equation. So it depends on the square. 
All right, so it depends on the square. So um, theta is the same thing. So you got one half alpha t squared. Okay, so if we've got this theta for this alpha, what happens when t for, for a time of one, what happens, do you think, to theta if we have the time? If we have the time, do we just have the distance, or is it smaller than that or bigger than that? Hopefully it's not bigger. Otherwise, we've done something really kind of funky. All right. So which one is it? What? B. B. Because if you take, what happens when you take one half squared? What do you get? One fourth. So if I stick a one half in there for that T over there. There we go. Now, see, so there, displacement to acceleration is a quadratic relationship. What about good old velocity or angular velocity to uh, acceleration? Angular velocity, now, velocity to acceleration is a nice linear relationship because acceleration is the change in velocity or change in time. Okay, so that's, that's easy. That's vt equals a. So therefore, if I got, if it, if it goes omega in time t, what if I have the time? How fast is it going to be going? So it be a fourth or a half this time? Half. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with what Blake said. Half. Yep. There we go. Now, okay, here's where we really wanted to get to. We're going to be talking about torque today and moments of inertia and all this stuff. All the stuff you did in the lab a week and a half ago that you had no idea what you were doing. We're going to do it now. All right? So here we go. All right. Um, well, and we're not even going to get to what you did. In lab, did you do the one where you spun the plates and then you dropped the plate on top of it and it slowed down? Did you do that? Okay. And you're doing the conservation of angular momentum, right? That's at the very end of this chapter. That, we'll talk about that on Thursday. So we're only two weeks behind lab. That's not bad. That's not bad. Did you do anything with energy at all in lab? One half mv squared stuff equals mgh? No? Or, or do you just go to lab and just endure it for two hours and just can't wait to get in, and you do a brain flush when you walk out? <laughs> that's what happens? Oh, that's too bad. All right. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah, I remember the labs. Um, all right, you're using a wrench to loosen a rusty nut. Now, first of all, we found out that the rusty nut was actually whoever came up with this slide. Because if you're going to loosen this thing, are you going to twist it that way? No. Okay, so the rusty nut is the developer of this slide or the person who's presenting it to you, one or the other. All right, so we actually want to tighten this rusty nut according to these pictures. Which one's going to do us the most good? A, B, C, or D? B. Why? Common sense. Common sense. Ah, this is, wow, well, look at this stuff. It's, it's got, well, yeah, leverage. Le so what are we talking about? We're talking about, right? Okay. This is a, this is a Paul Simon chapter because you're gonna, we're going to do 50 ways to love your lever. Anyway, sorry. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. That's an old Muppet Show joke. But anyway. Um, but this is. This is leverage. And what you guys, you guys are talking about when you mean leverage is you mean torque. And torque is equal to R times force or cross force. That's the vector notation for it. Which is actually, but what, we, what we do is we... We don't want to mess with this uh, vector algebra of cross products in this course. So we just say, hey, it's real simple. You just take R times the parallel or perpendicular F. So it's the perpendicular part. So in other words, this guy here, the lever arm is up, going up this way and across that way. So I would actually want this angle off F here would be this one. So I'd want the sine. So you take F, so the torque actually equals R times the F times
times the sine of the angle that it makes, okay, with the axis of rotation. Right here, marker coming straight out at you, that's the axis of rotation. So as so we tighten this thing down, so if I get a bigger R with the same F, bigger R with the same F, and the one that's the most perpendicular provides me the most torque, okay? All right. So B, you guys are right, right, common sense, there you go. This not, or, or just, uh, not common sense, but um, practical applications that you've used it many, many times, okay. Okay. What's the difference between arrangement one and four? First of all, it's A and D. They're not even consistent there. What's the, is there any difference between the, between the torque that you're going to get in A and the torque that you're going to get in D, do you think? Is there any difference? Remember, we can move vectors around as long as we keep them in the same direction and with the same magnitude, we can move them. So I can just throw out the rod and move this force right here. Boom. There it is. Same thing. Right. There's absolutely no... No difference whatsoever. So if you actually had a setup like that, you wouldn't exert any more force? You would not exert any more torque. Or torque. 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 Okay. And torque, notice, it's in Newton, it's in meters, Newtons. Or we also call it Newton meters. What else is in Newton meters? What else do we call Newton meters? Uh, energy, right? It, joules? Now, force, work, force times distance, Newton meters is joules. This is not a joule, though, because joules are scalar. This is a vector, all right? And as we found out that we are not loosening this resting net, if we turn it this way, if we go clockwise, we do righty-tighty, right? So the direction of it goes in, or it comes back out this way, if we go the other way. Now, by convention, by convention, clockwise is negative, counterclockwise of torque is positive, all right? Clockwise is, clockwise is negative because because if we cross um, y into x, we'll get a negative z, but if we cross x into a positive y, we get a positive z, so that's why it works out that way. Okay, if I made you do the vector algebra, you'd see how, why that works, but we don't need to do all that silly stuff. You just got to keep in mind that counterclockwise is positive. Okay, question five. Two forces produce the same torque. Does it follow that they have the same magnitude? If two forces produce the same torque, do they necessarily have to have the same magnitude? No, not at all. Because if I have 10 newtons of force pushing perpendicular on something one meter away, that would give me the same uh, torque as if I had a one newton force, a little tennis ball, 10 meters away, pushing on it, okay? Remember what Archimedes said. If you give me a big enough lever, I can move the earth, right? That's, that was one of his big quotes. He, all right. All right, because torque is a product of force times distance, two different forces that act at different distances could still have the same torque. 10 times one equals one times 10. That kind of stuff. Four times three equals six times two. We could do this all night. All right, anyway. Okay, if the torques are identical, does that mean the forces are, now, I remember when this came up earlier this afternoon. To me, this was a logically equivalent question as the one before, isn't it? Okay. I'm writing a textbook company. I used to, I, I used to like mastering physics, but this, this thing is, they didn't do a very good check for this. If two torques are identical, does that mean their forces are identical as well? I'm trying to think. Oh no, we just, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. This one kind of reminds me of that Far Side cartoon. You ever seen that Far Side cartoon where it says push to uh, or pull to enter? 
you got the guy pushing on it, and it says school of the some. What? Gifted. Yeah, school of the gifted. Yeah. All right. So does four cause any torque whatsoever on the hinge? Here's our, here's our axis of rotation. Here's the hinge. We want to open this door like this. Okay. All right. So does four, will four get us the door open? No. No. That's, that's when you walk into a door that's partially open. It's a very painful thing to do. All right. Um, all right. So we're down to F1 or F3. Which one's going to provide the most torque? F1, because it's the most perpendicular. It is perpendicular. So it's just pushing that thing right up there. Okay, so here's how you do, here's how you figure it out if it's going to be positive or negative. Remember, coming out of, at you is positive. Going into the, into the screen is negative. So, you put your fingers in the direction of the line of axis. Okay, and then curl, curl your fingers up. This is the right-hand rule, and boom coming out this your thumbs coming out towards you so it's positive also this would just cause this to rotate in a counterclockwise direction so therefore it's also positive okay all right I think we're getting close to the end here all right how if we're gonna have some torque how large does f4 need to be Can F4 ever produce torque? No. <laughs> so that's one of those. Well, that's a stupid question. That's their third stupid thing that they've written up here. And they're usually pretty good. And, and to ace this quiz, you've got to say perpendicularly three times as fast as you can. Right. Okay, cassette player. This brought some chuckles from the afternoon crowd. Does anyone, is, have any of you ever even seen a cassette player? A real to real player? Okay, all right. So you, you've actually seen one. All right, that's good. that's good. Because you were really cool back in like 72, 73, if you had a real to real player, put your Jethro Tull on there. You know, yeah, well, 8-track, yeah. the 8-track, you were way cool. And if you, could punch it just right you could like play your favorite song like every other song or something like it all right okay when the tape is played on the cassette deck there's a tension in the tape that applies a torque to the supply reel okay so picture in your mind thought puzzle you got this big cassette tape that's got a tension pulling that way pulling straight across okay as the tension remains constant while it's playing now Here's what happens. The tape gets smaller and smaller. How does this applied torque vary as the supply reel becomes empty? Does the torque increase, torque decrease, or torque remain constant? They're going to keep the same force. The tension is going to be the same, so what's going to happen with our torque here? Is it constant or decreasing? Why would it be decreasing? Yeah, because R is getting smaller. So if, T, if the force stays the same, torque equals R times F perpendicular, and this is nice and perpendicular. So as the torque, so as the as T stays the same, but the radius gets smaller, then that torque should decrease. I think this is our last question. Yep. What's the next? Oh yeah, I hated this question. I didn't get it, so I didn't even want to do it. For some reason. Yeah, I thought that was cheesy. Okay, enough of that. All right, so that was what, eight questions? Something like that? Nine. nine. That'll work. Okay, go ahead and put your name on it and say, I answered nine questions. Satisfied. If you forgot to, if you're so overcome with that captivating lecture there that you forgot to put down answers, just make sure you give me a sheet of paper with your name on it so I can say, yeah, they're here. All right. All right, all right. I'll take James. Sound good. Okay. All right. Okay. 
And we got Emily's. Okay. Good. All right. Okay, now. I'm going to go ahead and go through the lecture, and then I had something else, but it, it kind of turned out to be a little bit of a disaster this afternoon, so they, like I said, they're my dress rehearsal before I get to you all, and oh, it's time to go. No, that's late. Okay. They haven't said that yet. All right. I didn't think y'all would be so patient if it was 12 minutes past the time. All right. But it is nice now. My morning runs. I can actually see what's going on. I don't have to wear my little don't hit me belt anymore. Uh, so that's good. But it's dark now when we go home. Oh, well. All right, now. What are we going to? Oh, yeah. I was going to do the lectures. But then, but then we'll work some problems. Oh, by the way, waiting for you are assignments 13 or 14, I think. I, I gave, what about 12? It's there. Or maybe it's 12 and 13. I, I. Anyway, there's two more assignments. There's two new assignments that are due. Uh, one's due a week from tomorrow, and the other one's going to be due a week from Friday. Then you got one due that's due like Monday. So you're going to be doing a lot of physics. But um, I did give one like huge assignment. I was like, no, that's too big. That'll be overwhelming. So I broke it down into two smaller ones. All right. Okay. All right. Same amount of points and everything. It's just more palatable, well, and, and that way you'll get to work on it because it's due in eight days. And it's not too bad. So let's go through the uh, lecture here real quick up to, through section 8.3, okay? We're going to be talking about rotational motion and equilibrium. Rotational equilibrium is what this is talking about. Got that vector going up this way. And eventually that this spinning here causes her to spin, okay? In, in a counter direction to the spinning of that thing. All right, and we'll talk about all that kind of stuff. Basically, it's the way gyroscopes work, keep things in place. All right, we're going to talk about rigid bodies. We'll, we're going to get down to here today, and we're going to leave rotational work and kinetic energy. Um, by the way, you got one more energy thing you got to learn. Um, and that is the rotational energy, which is one half I omega squared. Okay, that's a lot like one half mv squared, but it's I omega squared, which is the moment of inertia and the and the rotational speed squared. All right, and now, and we'll talk about those the top three things. All right, a rigid body. Remember, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball, right? Because that that wrench is a rigid body which means that um, it's a system of particles, which, um, in other words, it's a nice solid piece of um, metal that doesn't behave like a water balloon when you throw it, all right? Because a water balloon globs around, right? And so its particles move around, all right? But a wrench, it doesn't move. Neither does a ball too much, all right? A human body on the head, that's why they say, raise your hand if you can think of an exception. Uh, must be solid, but not all solid bodies are rigid. Like we're pretty solid, right? But we are definitely not rigid. Okay? If you launch, we can change our center of mass all the time. That's the other thing. I, I think that's another definition of a rigid body. It's something where its center of mass does not change. All right. Okay, but we can change our center of mass. You guys have the wrong kinds of chairs because we'll do a center of mass. Have you ever done? Well, this chair is too heavy. That one looks too big, too. But anyway, all right, we're going to do a quick center of mass thing that you can do with people. All right? What I want you to do is put both feet just firmly on the floor. Put both feet on the floor. All right? And sit up straight. Sit up straight. I know it's kind of hard right now. Now, what I want you to do, without rocking forward or without pushing yourself up, stand. <laughs> Rashonda, the athlete, goes, my body won't do that instantly. She's like, no way. You can't do it, right? People try, especially as soon as you get junior high boys, they'll try anything, you know. They'll, yeah, I did it. No, you didn't. All right, the reason is because your feet are pushing up, trying to, are, are pushing up, and the floor is pushing, your feet is pushing down, floor is pushing back, but it's not pushing back on your um, center of mass. Your center of mass is right above your, is 
pretty much where your chest is. For men, it's right about up here. For women, it's a little bit lower. Um, and, uh, but it's still in line with the seat, so you can't move yourself. Now, have you ever tried this, where you take a chair, like take this chair, you need a little bit smaller chair than this, and, and you have a, and you put it against the wall, and you have a man or boy come over, lean his forehead against the wall, and pick up the chair, and then try and stand. He can't do it, because all of his center of mass is now completely changed, and his, his back can't um, contort. But a woman, piece of cake. She can, she can do that without any trouble. So we'll look at those kinds of issues because this very much fits into the center of mass and where things rotate around something. Okay. All right. But first, let's talk about translational and rotational. Let's, let's get something rolling. All right. First of all, to get anything to roll, you need our friend friction. Things don't roll if there's no friction, right? It's like my cousin Vinny, or Mississippi's famous for its, or Alabama's famous for its mud. You know, you got mud, you're going to spin, all right? Well, anyway, um, you need friction for it to be rolling. And the way that works, this is translational motion. This is I'm taking the solid body and just moving it like this, so every particle is moving V in the same direction. So you guys, now, Down at the molecular and actually at the subatomic or at the atomic level, nothing is a solid body because everything is moving, right? Every atom pulsates at the speed of light, vibrates. The only thing is keeping you from flying out the room at the speed of sound, not speed of light, speed of sound, is that you're all not moving in the same direction, all right? Moving in all different directions. Now, but anyway, if we translate the rigid body on a macro scale and we spin it about this axis, right? And, it, and we've got some good old friction here that'll stop it just for that split second. In other words, right there at the contact point, it's zero, the velocity is zero, because I add these two vectors together and get zero. I add these two vectors together, I get two V. I add this vector with the zero vector, I get V, that's the speed of the axle going. And the speed of that axle gives me my um, speed of the car, which would, or bicycle, which would be r times omega, okay? Because this v is the same as this v, which is v equals r times omega. That's the way, th that's the way I roll. That's the way everybody rolls, all right? That's the way, that's the way things roll, all right? Okay, and the distance that they cover Again, it's just our good old friend, S equals R times theta. Because if I take, um, if, I, if I start here, no, it's rolling down like this, all right? So this would be the red paint from here to here. There it is. There it is in this new position, and that's how far it's gone. It's this good old R times theta. And so the velocity of the center of mass, that's what that VCM stands for, is equal to R omega, okay? Okay, now, we've already talked about torque. I kind of got you ready. We're thinking about torque there for a minute. All right, now, this, he's not providing very good torque if he's pulling it this way, but that's okay. The only thing that's providing the torque is this portion of the vector. If I take, I'm gonna put this guy in his two components here. One goes this way, one goes that way, and this one is the sine. So we've got R times F sine of theta, okay? But we drop it down here to this distance R. Now, you can do it this way. And off this, in other words, don't change the force, but take the sine of R. Doesn't matter, either one, it'll work. Just as long as you get the sine of the angle, because the sine of the angle is a separate, separate thing, all right? Now this one, if you're pushing like this, that's not causing very much torque on that. Okay. All right, good. So we understand that too. Okay, and there we are. There's the thing we've been talking about. Okay. Torque is a vector, and, we, and it's in that meters 
Newton's thing, which looks a lot like Newton meters, which is a jewel, but that's not the case. Oh, that's going to be noisy, wasn't it? Sorry. Didn't mean to do that. All right. But anyway, and its direction is along the axis of rotation with the sign given by the right-hand rule or counterclockwise, positive, clockwise, negative. All right. So this is the force on her back. Here's her center of gravity. She's, she's in equilibrium because the force on her back and her weight about this pivot point here. So if I take this axis, this F of B goes this way, or MG goes that way, about this pivot point, those two torques add up to zero, or those two torques cancel each other out, then she's at, um, she's in equilibrium. She's not going to tip over, right? But if you lean way, get your center mass way out over your base, what's going to happen? You're going to fall on your face. Right? Okay. These two for there's forces working at work here, right? All three of these forces, these forces are in are in. Um, the forces are in equilibrium, but why is, first of all, which one of these objects is going to be spinning? Right, the one, the one on the far, right over here. Yeah, because it makes sense. We just go, and it'll spin. This one, not so much. That, that won't get it to spin. But notice, the sum of the forces in the x direction on this thing add up to zero, so therefore it has no acceleration, but it does have angular acceleration because it's going to spin. Because the torque, this torque, again, put your fingers in the direction of the thing, spin, oop, goes that way, put your fingers in the direction of the R, and then rotate your fingers in the direction of the force, oop, goes that way, we got two things going that way, so therefore, it's going to spin. Okay? If we have, if we put one, if we move this force and have it going this way, then that is like this, and this one is like that, and so they're, if they're opposite torques, opposite with the same magnitude, thing's not going to spin. Okay? And so we base, so therefore, aha! Let's do this problem. This is a nice little problem. Okay? I probably should have made this a quiz instead of that silly. Well, no, I, I like what we did before because it kind of got our minds right on what we were going to be doing. So, but this one, this is a nice little problem. Um, I think I give you one of your homework problems is what if you stack a bunch of books and then and we'll, we'll look at that here in a minute. Um, all right. Now, this one, even though this is in, in grams, I mean, we could change it to 50 meters and 25 grams and long ruler like that. But for the most part, um, we can just leave. We just won't tell anybody. But we're just going to do in gram centimeters here, all right? Because the because the 9.8. In other words, he experiences the same gravity as him and as him, so we can cut out the mg. We, the g's would cancel in the equation anyway. So we can just look at this and say, okay, we're going to take the torque is going to be 25 times. Here's our pivot point. So what's this torque? Is this first of all is this torque positive? or negative that's being caused by that 25 gram weight there? Is it positive or negative? Very careful now. Which way is it rotating? Counterclockwise, so therefore it's positive. Okay, so this would be 25 times what? Zero? 20? 50? Which one? Yeah, it's 20 times 50, right? Because here's our pivot point. And it's positive. What about this guy? He's going to be 75 times what? 30. Okay, and he's positive. Okay, so this guy has to counter, this guy has to counter these two torques because he's negative. Because he's going this, put your fingers along the R and then rotate the direction of the force that he would be going. He's going down. Oh. Oh, sorry. Okay. Anyway, he's going down. And where would you multiply him by? 
He's M3 times what? 30 no no just leave it as 35 but put the negative sign in front of me that's the way we do that's the way we do things here is we just look at the picture and go okay he's negative first two are positive uh, he's 35 not 85 that's a common mistake that you know in in the heat of battle of an exam or something you'd put down 85 because that's the number that's staring you in the face so that's what you put down all right so basically all I got to do is take 25 times 50 plus 75 times 30, and divide that by 35, because M3 times 35 equals those two, and you wind up with M3 is equal to 100. Okay. Now, it also doesn't matter where you take the pivot point. We could have taken the pivot point here, right here, but we would have had a small problem. And the problem would have been this. The problem would have been this. They didn't give me what the normal was here. Okay? Because this normal force is actually causing a torque. Again, here's R. He's causing a torque here. He's causing a positive torque here. And he's causing a negative torque over there. On that far end over there. Okay. All right. I think they worked that one out. All right. Now, for something to stay stable, it's got, if it has a nice wide band, that's why they t all, tell you all the time in, in athletics or, or anything like that, that, even dancing, I guess. Um, got to have your feet apart a little bit, right? So that you got a nice wide base, so your center of gravity is above your feet, so you're stable, all right? You're not stable if you're like in a line, you know, doing a sobriety test or something like that. Not that I know what that's like. But anyway, um, actually, I don't. That's a good thing. But anyway, all right. Um, so, and things will go back to their equilibrium state. In other words, so you are that new silly TV show, V, The Visitors. So they come over and they try and knock over the Washington Monument. Okay? They push on the edge of it. It's going to bounce back. All right? Because its center of gravity is right here. As long as you keep that center of gravity above the uh, pivot point, or, um, as long as the center of gravity stays inside the base here, notice the center of gravity out here on the Washington Monument that's upside down, it tips over real easy. Okay? It tips over real easy. Because once, once the center of gravity gets past the pivot, gets above the pivot point there, it's going to fall on over. It's kind of like that new Malcolm, or it's a, it's a little bit older book by Malcolm Gladwell, Tipping Point. Ever heard of that book? Seen that book? Talks about all these social phenomenons that, like, why all of a sudden did hush puppies become huge again? You know, a couple of people started wearing them. Before you know it, everybody's wearing them without any advertising. We don't know. There's social phenomena like that. Things reach a tipping point. They're talking about what we at the tipping point in Afghanistan or something like that. Okay. All right. I don't have anything to say about this. <laughs> okay. Balance carefully on a narrow base of support right here. In other words, if I balance this real close and then just barely touch this guy, doink, he's just going to keep on falling. But this one here, the center of gravity is right here. If I pull, push him this way, he's going to go back pretty quick because the center of gravity is going to have a tendency to stay above the, the basis of support. But here the center of gravity the base of support is so small right here, it's going to tip over. All right, I think we've belabored that point. Okay, rotational dynamics. Here we go. Here's the biggie. What the heck is this? MR squared times alpha. Now, alpha we know. What is alpha? Angular acceleration, right? That's a good old angular acceleration. So the net torque on something is equal to mr squared, where this is the mass, and this is the radius squared of the axis here that's acting on it, times alpha. Now, this part right here, this mr squared, that's going to be different for different objects, all right? And for where they're spinning, and we'll look at that here in a minute. But this thing right here, 
This MR squared basically is called, let's go on to the next slide here. That's our good old, this looks very complicated. It's just taking a sum of a bunch of particles. Basically, it's an integral. But um, anyway, it's called a moment of inertia. All right? So let's go on and look at what we mean by that. Now, that moment of inertia, here we go. Here's some objects. Here's some eyes for some various objects. All right, so if I want to spin this little particle right here around this axis, all right, say there's no friction here, that's free to turn. If I want to spin that particle around, its moment of inertia is equal to mr squared. Moment of inertia is just like mass with inertia in that, remember what inertia is? The more mass I have, the more force I need to get it to move. The same thing here. The bigger my moment of inertia is, the more force I need to get it to spin. All right? Okay. So, let's say this rod has the same mass. Okay? Let's say this rod has the exact same mass. All right? Now, which one's easier to spin? When I have a rod going through the middle of it here and I'm just spinning it around that rod go, that way or if I'm trying to get the whole thing if I've got it spinning around an axis here and it's going around this way which one looks which one's easier to do what's that yeah this one because this is ml squared divided by 12 this one is ml squared divided by 3 so this one is four times easier to spin, okay? Okay, all right. Let's see if there's anything else here. <coughs> Howard Tingy, do you happen to know a thin disk? A thin disk is just like this. It's MR squared, right? They're not going to commit. No. All right. That's okay. You don't have to. I thought it was the same MR squared, right? Thin disk. Is it easier to spin? No. I don't know. We'll have to see. I think it's the thing. But anyway, so. All right. Now, there we go. There's the slideshow. Now, let's do some of the problems here. We got about 15 minutes or so and the first problem that we had first problem that I was going to look at was they hung this picture now they did a funny thing this picture this is going to look really difficult. Looks like you're figuring grades or something here. Anybody seen an eraser? Ah. All right. They hung a picture like this. This would be like the way I'd hang a picture. All right. Got this picture. Center of mass is right here. Mg hanging down. It's hanging about this thing here. This is like 45 degrees. And oops, I didn't quite get this one right. Oh, well, let's make this one 50 degrees. And this is 45 degrees. Not quite hanging just right. So I've got T1 going this way. And I got a T2 going this, or actually, doesn't matter. T, T2 going that way. So what we'll do, and they're all hanging off this, this axis right here. What we want to do is we want to find T1 and T2. Now this is, just to show you that it's in equilibrium, these are forces in equilibrium because it's not falling. All right, so it's in equilibrium. So when I take the sum of all the forces in the y direction and the sum of all the forces in the x direction, what should I get for their mass times acceleration? Zero, right, zero, because it's in equilibrium, okay? Now, and this thing also, there's, there would be torques going on about this thing right here. 
because we've got this T going this way and this T perpendicular that way. MG, though, is not causing any torque on that because it's right in, it's on the axis of rotation there. Okay, so it's not causing any torque, but the T1 and T2 torque would also cancel each other out. What they want us to do is find T1 and T2. So we go, okay. So the free body diagram actually looks like this. MG, T2 shooting off like this at 45 degrees. T1 shooting off like this at 50 degrees. Okay. All right. So we go about and solve this. We say, okay, well, the sum of the forces in the y direction. Ooh, I've got T2y here. I've got T1y. And I've got T1x. And I've got T2x. Breaking down into its components there. So I got T2y, which is T2 times the sine of 45 plus T1 times the sine of 50 minus mg equals zero. By the way, the mass of this thing was supposed to be 3.0 kilograms. So there we go. That's our equation for the y direction. Uh-oh, I've got two unknowns and only one equation. I better write down my equation for the x directions. Again, the sum of the forces in the x direction, when it's all said and done, are going to equal zero. So I'm going to get T2. Oh, which way is T2 going? Positive or negative? Here's T2x right here. Negative. It's going this way. So he's minus T2 cosine of 45. I probably have this all backwards from what the book had, but with my problem, it's working out. Plus T1 cosine of 45. So there we go. That equals zero. So I can say, all right, T1 cosine of 45. What's that? I've got the angles backwards. Oh, well, that's not right. There we go. Thanks. Now, this one's wrong. See? This fraught with peril to make all kinds of mistakes. Cosine of 45. So T1 equals T2 times the cosine of 45 divided by the cosine of 50. Oh boy, I get to take this and stick him in here and then solve for T2. I'll keep you out of the streets at night. Or you can just go to that www.1728.com and go to two equations, two unknowns. You're there. You can solve them pretty quick. Okay. So that's just showing all the forces are in equilibrium. Now let's take a look at something spinning. Okay. Let's take a look at something that might be spinning. Ah, I was right. A disk, the moment of inertia of a hollow disk is I equals mR squared if it's really thin. It's just like a particle. That's what I thought. It just kind of made sense that that's what it would be. All right. Well, let's take a look at, um, we've already seen things in equilibrium. Oh, so let's take a look at when somebody, we've got a gymnast doing the iron cross, okay? We've got a gymnast doing the iron cross. Now, here's what happens. All of a sudden, when he's, when he's coming down like this, there's absolutely no way he can be perfectly vertical. In fact, if you hang anything with a fairly, very, very light um, piece of metal, hang any kind of picture, you're always, you're always, always, always um, 
going to have, you're never going to be able to keep it perfectly straight like that. You're always going to have, it's, um, let's say you're trying, to, you're always going to have some kind of, well, in this case, some kind of bending like this. All right? You can never, ever get it to go perfectly straight like that. All right? Because, if you think about it, all of a sudden my sine of 45 becomes a sine of zero. What's the sine of zero? That's zero. And so all of a sudden I've got T2 plus T1 sine of zero minus mg equals zero. So all of a sudden I don't have any tension. I've got to have something counteracting that tension. Now, if we make this sign, if we make this angle really, really small, you'll see that the tensions get really, really huge. I mean, huge. Okay? The closer they get to um, zero. All right? They get, they get big. Really, really big. So, when a gymnast, it's in your book, they show a gymnast there with do, trying to do the iron cross. So when they judge gymnasts, they, they look at their arms like this. They try and see how big of an angle that they're going to make right here. The smaller the angle, of course, the more the judges award them points because it takes an amazing amount of strength to maintain that. All right, so that was that little quip. But now let's take a look at one of the problems. Uh... Let's take a look at a handful of the problems, or just a couple of the problems that I, that I assigned you for chapter 8. I think that would be better. Let's take a look at, well, these things here. All right. Just so you get used to it. All right. It says, a real rose. This is like problem 4. No, let's do problem 4. That's what I gave you. It says a bowling ball with a radius of 15 centimeters travels down the lane so that its center of mass is moving at 3.6 centimeter meters per second. The bowler estimated that it makes about 7.5 complete revolutions in two seconds. Okay, so far so good. It is rolling without slip. Is it rolling without slipping? All right, you can tell if it's rolling without slipping if R omega equals VCM. This is rolling without slipping. Okay, here's, where some, of, here's some of the things that they told us. They said uh, VCM of the bowling ball was equal to 3.6 meters per second. It said that R was equal to 0.15 meters. That's, that'd be 15 centimeters, right? Or is that 0 0.015? That doesn't seem right. Hold on a second. 15 centimeters is 0 0.015, right? No, I'm losing my marbles. It's 0.15 meters, right? Because centa 100, yes. There's 100 centimeters in a meter, right? Not 1,000. Good. I'm glad I know that. All right. And then it said that it did revolutions, seven revolutions every two seconds. Hmm. So what's its frequency? Uh, it's about 3.5, right? Wouldn't it, would that be right? That's what it said. It said it goes, the bowler estimates, oh, 7.5 revolutions per two seconds. So, its frequency would be revolutions per second. So, its frequency is equal to 7.5 divided by 2. That would be 3.75 hertz. You might be going, what? Hertz? You mentioned that once, kind of in passing. Well, that's frequency, okay? Here you go. And I've probably mentioned this once in passing, too. 
that omega equals um, 2 pi times f. Okay. Because remember when we had that whole revolutions thing? How many revol 7.5 revolutions? Well, theta in that case would be 2 pi times 7.5, right? So this is 15 times uh, divided. So this is 15 pi divided by 2. So we got 2 pi times. Yeah, so it works out. <laughs> Method of my madness here. All right, so that's omega. So what you'd have to do is you'd say, okay, you take r, 0.15 times 2 pi f, and that should be equal to 3.6. If it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's slipping, okay? In other words, this is spinning faster than this. Or it could be skidding if this is going faster than this, all right? If y'all ever rolled a ball on ice before, it kind of slides. If you take a softball or baseball or something, and you roll it across ice, it'll slide. So it'll be going pretty fast, but its rotation's really slow. Okay. So that's skidding by slipping. Slipping is when it's going like this. It's kind of spinning in place. So there's problem four. Let's look at one that might be a little bit trickier. What else did I sign? Because I remember it was acting all funny. Okay. I, did, I mean, I didn't. Oh, let's end with this one. Let's end with this one. Because right, I know I gave you this one. This is a good one. I think this is the last problem you have on, on your first homework assignment that's due a week from Wednesday over this chapter. All right, here's what we've got. While standing on a long board resting on a scaffold, a 70 kilogram painter paints the side of the house as shown. All right, here's the picture. Here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. Oh, I'm probably going to get in trouble. Uh oh. I've always told myself, don't do this. Don't do physics on the fly. I haven't worked this problem out myself. So that can be treacherous. That was a little arrogant thing. Oh, I don't worry that. All right. Anyway, let's see. OK. So here's the deal. <laughs> this is 2.5 meters. 1.5 meters to this end, and uh, 1.5 meters to this end. All right, I've got a painter standing right here on the scaffolding. All right. Now you can do that. You can do that. Uh, As long as the, we want to know how far out, this will be our pivot point. We're not really worried about this pivot point here, okay? Um, this will be a pivot point. We want to know how far out here he can stand, okay? The mass of the painter is 70 kilograms. The uniform mass of the plank of the board is equal to, I hope they give me the mass of the board. It's 15 kilograms. They did. Bless their hearts. It's, and they also said it was uniform. They said the mass of the board is uniform. Okay? Now, he could probably stand there all day long if it was like a fairly strong wood, but gold from here to this end. Right? You can probably stand on there for a while. Well, it might even flip him up in the air. All right? But it's uniform. So, that uniform tells us we can do what? Center of mass. We can put it for the board where? There we go. That's why it's called the center of mass. All right. Good to have you back. There we go. So, here's the mass. Here's the MBG. 
Okay? And so, we want to know, this will be the R. We want to know what R is for this guy. Hey, we figured this out pretty good. So what we do is we go, okay, the force that he's exerting. In other words, he's going to be exerting a torque this way, which would be positive. The, board, the center mass of the board is going to be exerting a torque this way, which is negative. We want them to equal each other. We want them to add up to be zero. All right, so we want the net torque, the net torque to equal zero. This is very analogous, 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 whatever. It's a lot like F equals MA, except this is for rotational things. All right, so we got, so let's do the positive one. This would be 70 times G times uh, R minus 15 times, where, how far is that away? What's this distance right here? 1.25, right? Is it a 15? times 1.25, okay, equals zero, times G equals zero. So my G's cancel, that's nice. So I can just cancel, so I've got 70R equals 15 times 1.25. Oh good, it's gonna be a nice positive number. R is gonna equal 15 over 1.25 divided by 70, you better not go out there very far. What does that come out to be? We can, we can do this. Divide by 5. What's 70 divided by 5? 14. Over 3. So it's 3 fourteenths of... It's about 20% of 1.25. Whatever that comes out to be. 10% would be one would be 0.12. It's about 0.3 meters. I'm guessing. I don't know. What did you get, Sergio? Oh, hey. But if it was me, I wouldn't want someone to tell me, hey, you go out there, 0.3 meters. Whoops. All right. So there you go. There's one of your problems. There, there was two of them worked. They're not too bad. Just got to keep things in equilibrium for the first part. And then we're going to get into rotational dynamics so that our mechanical energy, I'm going to end with this thought. Mechanical energy of systems are now, oh, we got the springs. Now we've got rotation. Oh, boy. The fun never stops. All right, good. We'll see you all on Thursday. We'll do a handful more of your problems from the new homework.